Thank you, Jay. It's a great pleasure to be with you. I told my wife on the phone, they're treating me like they do in Spartanburg, my wife's hometown in, in South Carolina. It's just been a, such a warm welcome, and I'm just so grateful to all of you. Uh, thanks, thank you for the invitation and for coming uh, today. I have two sessions. Uh, the first one here for just about 45 minutes. And what I'd like to do is show you the ways that the Psalms structure prayer as music. And uh, we all listen to music and maybe we think it sounds good. And we might listen to a prayer uh, and, or a psalm and think it sounds good. But we're going to understand a little bit today about why it sounds good. Prayer is meant to be effective speech. The most effective speech there could ever be because with your prayer you're trying to get God to do stuff and if you're going to try to get God to do stuff you're going to say it as carefully and beautifully as you possibly can you want to motivate the deity to act on your behalf so in the Psalms we find numbers of these beautiful prayers carefully structured these Psalms are music they are poetry and so to begin today, I would like for us to actually sing a psalm. Are you ready? Oh, okay, very nice, very nice. Maybe I'll, I'll give you a couple of lines and then you can mimic me. Uh, this is a Hebrew, it's, it's a line from Psalm 133. Um, Behold, hine matov. How good umanayim, and how pleasant. Hine, behold, hine is a word that uh, you sometimes read, behold or lo. Really, hine just means, <laughs> it's in, untranslatable. It's like, behold, hine, hine, how good and how pleasant. Hine matov umanayim, shevet means dwelling or sitting or remaining ahim which is the word for brothers we have to add in sisters here too but they, they would have meant that when they said ahim shevet they would have meant brothers and sisters shevet ahim gam yahad as one so we're going to sing this song together i'll sing a line and then you can sing back to me and before you know it we'll be really rolling with the hebrew this afternoon okay okay Hine, let's see if we get better. Better. Hine matovu manayim shevet achim gam yahad. Hine matovu manayim shevet achim gam yahad. All right, so that's the first line. Let's try again. Hine matovu manayim shevet achim gam yahad. Hine matovu manayim. Shevet achim gam yahad. Now I appreciate the very proper um, way that you guys are singing. Um, in Hebrew, when you have the ch together, it's not achim, it's achim, achim, and that happens kind of back here where mucus is and stuff. I'm sorry to have to say that word in church, but that's what it is. It's 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 a guttural consonant so when you say achim you've got to get a little bit out get a little bit achim can you say achim with me achim oh are you sure this isn't the jewish food festival this is a you've got a great uh hebrew guttural going on so let's write hine matovu manayim shevet achim gam yahad hine matovu manayim Shevet achim gam yahad. Then we have the second part, but the same words. Hine matovu manayim. Hine matovu manayim. Let's do that again. Hine matovu manayim. Then back to the top. Hine matovu manayim. Shevet achim gam yachad. All right, now, from, from the top. Here we go. The whole thing. Hine matovu manayim. Shevet achim gam yachad. Hine matovu manayim. 
Sheverahim gam yahad. Hine ma tovu manayim. Hine ma tovu manayim. Sheverahim gam yahad. Now that was really nicely done, especially for some Methodists. Um, <laughs> I'm very deeply impressed, and I'm going to ask Sam to come up and lead this half of the group. And I'm going to lead this half of the group. Yes, we're going to do it in a round. Hebrew in a round, it's going to be great. So I'm going to turn my mic down. So, or maybe, Jay, could you give Sam your mic? Yeah, it's a free will offering. Yeah, here it is. Oh, good, 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 good. This will be great. So we're going to start right here. Hine matovu manayim sheverahim gam ya. Hine matovu manayim sheverahim gam ya. Hine matovu manayim sheverahim gam ya. Hine ma tovu manayim. Hine ma tovu manayim. Sheverahim gam yahad. Hine ma tovu manayim. Sheverahim gam yahad. Hine ma tovu manayim. Sheverahim gam yahad. Hine ma tov umanayim. Hine ma tov umanayim. Sheverahim gam yachad. Oh, very nicely. Thank you. Thank you, so, Sam, so much for stepping in at this special moment. How good and how pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to dwell and even to sing together in unity. This is one of the songs of ascent. It's a song that would be sung as pilgrims were going up to the temple. And as they would go up to the temple, they'd be walking together and they'd be singing this song. This very song. Now the melody that we just sang was probably not the melody that they would be singing back in the Iron Age in Israel. We've lost the score, sadly, for all the psalms. We've lost the score. We don't know what the music sounded like. It's a sad reality. But what we do have is we have the poetry. And so we're going to spend some time thinking very carefully about how the Psalms work as poetry and, of course, as music too. But since we don't have access to the, to the notes, we'll just take access to the, the poetry. Um, what makes a, a poem and what makes a poem good? In English... What are the marks of a good poem? It rhymes. Uh, yeah, that's right. It rhymes. Let's, so, so let's look at a really, really, really good English poem. <laughs> now, you think you're Joe. That's not a good poem. This is a great poem because you all know it. If I turn, you all know that poem. You can all recite it by memory. It is, oh, has, has a way of digging itself into your brain. That's what good poetry does. So, you know it well. Roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, and so are you. Now, what makes that good? I told you it's good, but you, maybe you don't believe me. What makes that such a good poem? It's easy to remember. What makes it easy to remember, though? It's got, it's got meter. Roses are red. Ya-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. Ya-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. It's not just, it's, but it isn't just repeating the whole way through. That last line gives a la da da da, a different sort of meter. But the, but the idea of having roses are red, so one, two, three, four, violets are blue, one, two, three, four. This is great. The English poetry often has a nice, easy meter. All right, what else makes it uh, good poetry? We like, but why? Why do we like it so much? It, well, yeah, let's talk about the imagery for a second. What sort of images come across in this poem? 
You've got color, right? Nothing more imagistic than color. You've got red. You all picture, I say red. You don't hear something, do you? You, th you think about red. I say uh, blue, red, blue. Um, what, and you also have imagery of flowers. What's prettier than a rose and a violet? So it's imagistic language. It evokes in our mind, if you just close your eyes and think about this poem, little flowers start to spread sprinkle out of your brain. It's wonderful. We also have, so we have visual things that we see. Anything else about the poem? We have, some, we have all of our uh, senses, don't we? we? We can see something. We can also um, taste sugar. Okay, so it's evoking more than just our imagistic imagination. It's, it's, inv it's inv invoking our uh, sensory our tastes imagination and also flowers don't just look good they smell good so it's it's engaging all of our sensibilities it's a wonderful poem for that reason why else is it so nice it, it's short it's terse i could have said i really like you basically says the same thing right but it's not so it's not too terse but it's, it's short, it's compact. It, it tells you exactly, I could have said, I really like the way you smell. I like how you look. You make me feel good. I kind of like the way you taste. Uh, you're, you're, you're great. That's about the same, but it's not poetry, right? It's not, it's not beautiful. It's not terse in the right ways. Any other reasons why this is such good poetry? Yeah, what gives, it, what gives it that heart feeling? What makes it feel like we're, we're hearing something about our, the way our hearts work? It's the senses, not the mind, but the heart. Okay, it's very much focused on the senses. It expresses your feelings. Yeah, this is a common uh, thing that poetry does. It expresses our inner, inner feelings. Let's look at the actual structure of it. Let's think about how it's, how it's coming across, how it's making the heart's feelings vocalized. Think about the ways that those first lines sound. Roses are red. Did you notice an, something? So, yeah, you've got a lot of roars. Roses are red. And then the next line, violets are blue. So you got ruh, ruh, and then v-buh, buh this is, this is how you break down poetry. And in fact, if you think about it, the v and the b are actually very similar sounds. In fact, one is a voiced labial fricative, and the other is a voiced uh, labial plosive, linguistically speaking. In fact, in many languages, b and v are the same, re rendered with the same consonant. So we've got, we've got a nice connection here on your lips. There's roses are red, violets are blue. What about the next line? Sugar is sweet. Ooh, two sibilants. Sugar is sweet and so. So three sibilants in a row. And then finally at the end, are you. Notice it's not just repeating the same sounds over and over again. It's not alliteration ad nauseum. But it's alliteration that's going somewhere. You. The, the climax of the poem, the last line, is something different than what's gone before, but it, it's also connected because it rhymes. Blue you. So it's a, it's a beautiful poem for all these reasons, because of its, its structure, its meter, its rhythm, the way the sounds are being produced. And moreover, it describes a, a feeling, a sort of love or affection, that, would be, that is hard to describe with just the, I love you. It that's, doesn't quite catch it. It gives a, a number of ways to convey all the wonderful ways in which you make someone happy. Sugar is sweet, and so are you. So that's a great English poem. Now, when we just sang, Hine Matov Umanayim Shevet Achim Gamyahad, we don't have the same sorts of structuring devices in Hebrew. 
You have, we have some meter in Hebrew, but not much. It's very hard to get at, especially when we read it in English. Because you read it in English and you've lost so much of the... So there's some alliteration there. You've got mato, umanayim, a little bit. But it's not, it's not graspable in English at all. What we do have that's graspable in English is the phenomenon of poetic parallelism. Well, yep, I said it. Poetic parallelism. What makes an ancient poem in the ancient uh, Semitic languages is this thing called poetic parallelism. So I want to talk to you about how parallelism works. This is actually not a prayer that you find in the Bible. This was a prayer that we found in the ground. Archaeologists excavated this prayer and it goes a little something like this. It's from an ancient place called Ugarit, which is on the Syrian coast. And it sounds like this. When a strong one has attacked your gates and axe wielder your walls, your eyes to Baal you shall lift up. O Baal, if you repel the strong one from our gates, the axe wielder from our walls, a bull, O Baal, we will consecrate. A vow, Baal, we will fulfill. A firstborn beast, Baal, we will consecrate. An offering, Baal, we will fulfill. A festal meal, Baal, we will prepare. To the sanctuary of Baal, we will descend. The pathway of the house of Baal, we will travel. And Baal has heard your prayer. He will repel the strong ones from your gates, the axe wielder from your walls. Every line in this poem uh, gives us a form of poetic parallelism. You see here, he will repel the strong one from your gates, the axe wielder from your walls. You see how these lines are in parallel? Strong ones, axe wielder, from your gates, from your walls. Look at the parallelism that's evident in lines F through J. A bull, bail, then we will do something. Bull, vow, firstborn beast, offering, festal meal, then the name of the God, then a statement about what we will do. See how there's a kind of rep repetitive structure to each particular line. This is how ancient Hebrew and Semitic poetry structures itself. It doesn't have rhyme scheme in the same way that English does. It doesn't have meter, but it has parallelism, where two lines relate to one another. So here's a great example from the Bible. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. We have two lines. We can call them cola if we're being fancy. You don't have to be fancy. But if we want to, I mean, we're in a beautiful church. Let's be fancy. Cola are, is the plural for colon. And so we've got colon A. Colon B is the second statement. Together, by colon. Oh, man, we are so fancy. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament relates to the heavens, right? The firmament is that fancy poetic word to describe the dome of the sky. If you look out in the sky, you might know there's a big dome over your head. That's the firmament. You don't often say, ah, behold the firmament. It's kind of a churchy word, or maybe not even that. The firmament proclaims, notice you got our telling, pretty straightforward term. Then the second line, proclaims. Do you proclaim to your spouse what happened to you during the day? No, you tip it. You might tell them after work. Some of you do proclaim, apparently. But there's two types of, there's the telling, and then it's intensified in the second line. Proclaims. So the heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. Now what's the relationship between the glory of God and God's handiwork? Earlier, we had basically synonyms between two, one regular word and one highfalutin word. But in the last little piece of this par these two parallel lines, we have glory, something that's the divine manifestation of God's holiness. That's what glory means. The divine manifestation of God's holiness. That which you, it can also mean God's heaviness, God's power. This heaven, the heavens are telling about this divine manifestation. The firmament pro proclaims God's handiwork. Now, we could have just said the sky 
and the world. Let's see. We could have just said, God made the sky. God is great. Not as exciting. The heavens are telling the glory of God. The firmament proclaims God's handiwork. That is, you can see God's glory by looking at what God has made. And this is something, you can see the glory of the architects and the builders by looking up at this, these incredible arches up there. They proclaim the glory of the architects, in part. They also evoke the glory of God. But just tangibly, they proclaim the glory of the architects. It's their handiwork. Outside, when you go and see those humongous oaks and the stars and the skies and the clouds going by, those proclaim the glory of God. That's what the psalm is trying to get across. But it doesn't just say it in one line. It makes two statements, two parallel statements. And it is as if through those parallel statements, you get a rich stereoscopic vision. You know, you cover one eye and you get one picture of everything. But if you have two eyes, you have a sense of depth and solidity to what you're looking at. That's the, that's the function of parallelism on the reader and the listener. So we have three types of parallelism, roughly. This was a guy named Bishop Robert Loth, who's a great, great contemporary of our Wesleyan uh, forebears, as a matter of fact. And uh, Bishop Loth decided that he was reading through the Bible, and before, before uh, Bishop Loth, you opened up the prophets, you opened up the Psalms, and there was no, that's a hymnal, there was no white space. There was no white space. You just read, and it looked like this. Read through the Psalms, just a bunch of paragraphs. But Loth decided, you know what, I think what we're dealing with is poetry, and now the Psalms look like this, thanks to Loth. That is, he understood that Hebrew poetry is not based on rhyme, rhythm, and meter, but it's based on this notion of parallel lines coming together to create a rich meaning uh, for, every, for every line in the, in the uh, poetry of the Bible. So Psalm 24, the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those that dwell therein. The earth, then the world in the second line, and all that is in it and those who live in it. Now, this is synonymous parallelism because it basically means the same thing in both lines. The only thing missing from the second line is the Lord's. But having heard the first line, you know what the second line, the, the second line also belongs to the Lord, right? So that's synonymous. Then you've got antithetic parallelism. Check out this Psalm 1-6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. So here you've got a contrast between the two lines, but they're still related. So the Lord knows, and knows here in this sense means kind of is intimately aware of and conscious of and, and caring for. That's all in, in the semantic field of knows. The way of the righteous, that one good way, but the way of the wicked, God does not know that way. That way is going to go somewhere totally else. So two types of knowing... Or and two types of um, ways, one good, one bad. Then we've got something called synthetic parallelism. And this is the category Loth was like, well, not every line is either clearly synonymous or clearly antithetical. So I have to create a kind of garbage can category. And so I'll call it synthetic parallelism. And so a text like Psalm 77, the clouds stream water, heavens rumbled, your errors flew about. Not exactly synonymous, but not exactly antithetical, so we'll call it synthetic. But you can still tell the lines are parallel, right? So it makes, it makes some sense. This is a, like a divine theophany here. God is appearing in the course of a thunderstorm. These arrows are lightning coming down uh, from heaven. So when Loth sketched out this very simple and elegant understanding of Hebrew parallelism, scholars took off with it. And they realized that this was a garbage can category, synthetic, and they started creating hundreds of different types of parallelism, all sorts of different ways that these lines could interact. And the types of parallelism multiplied and multiplied so that biblical scholars could go through every line of the poetry of the Bible and tell you what kind of parallelism is operative. In addition to, um, and, and this sort of 
treatment of the, the parallelism of the Psalms was vastly influential, not just for biblical scholars, but for all scholars of literature all throughout the world. In fact, Gerard Manley Hopkins understood, some of you may know his poetry, understood parallelism to be the essential binding element for all poetry, reaching back all the way from Hebrew all the way into English. And if you ever read Gerard Manley Hopkins' poetry, it feels like you're reading a psalm that rhymes. It's very beautiful. You should check out some of his work if you uh, have a chance. Then came a theorist called Roman Jakobson, a Russian linguist, who was influenced by Loth and Hopkins. And Jakobson said, parallelism is actually the key to understanding all elevated speech throughout the entire world. Jakobson understood parallelism in the broad sense, not just as occurring between two lines, but he thought he understood alliteration, like we talked about before, as parallelism of sound rhyme as parallelism of sound as well. And we have then uh, a whole number of different ways that parallelism works throughout poems. So if you could find a refrain, that's parallelism. It's just parallelism on a big scale. Alliteration, micro parallelism. If you find any sort of um, structuring device within the, the poetry, any sort of poetry, you would call that parallelism. So here's a couple of examples. You don't really uh, need to see that. But the end result is that people started identifying parallelism in poetry all over the world. So if you look at this piece from the Gilgamesh epic, which is an ancient uh, poem, he anointed himself with oil, turned into a man, he put on clothing, became like a warrior. That's parallelism, friends. That's... Uh, outside the Bible. And check out Beowulf. This is another ancient poem, but not even anywhere related to the Hebrew poetry. The leader of the troop unlocked his word hoard. Ooh, I like that. You could tell I would like that. Uh, the distinguished one delivered this answer. So the word hoard is the answer. Wow, that's, a, that's some wonderful parallel imagery. Parallelism is everywhere. And the argument that I'd like to make to you is we need to listen to the Psalms for parallelism. When you, when you read a Psalm, it's easy just to kind of read it through and think, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, it makes me lie down in green pastures, and imagine the images that come across your mind. That's great. That's a wonderful way of reading. But the Hebrew would read for the parallelism that would be occurring between the two lines the reader would try to understand what does it mean uh, to have the statement, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. How do those two, the, those two lines say the same thing, say something different, or turn and give us a new meaning on the general idea that the earth belongs to God? This is how to read uh, Hebrew poetry with real care and sensitivity. And uh, not just reading it uh, between, for looking for parallels in between uh, two lines, but also listening for key words that appear over and over and over again in the, psal in the psalm. When you do that, you're listening for parallelism of minor elements. So parallelism happens on a macro structure and it happens on the micro structure of the psalm. And this is where we come back to the notion of the Psalms as music. Have you ever listened to a piece of music? Yes, you have, I'm sure. If you've listened to a piece of music, you know that music has to repeat in order to make sense to you. You don't, um, if we think about a great piece of music, um, can anybody just name a piece of music and I guarantee I can tell you how it repeats. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. There's some re repetition there, right? That was easy. Anybody else got a heart, got an easy one? Yeah. Okay, I don't know that piece. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, any pop song you listen to, uh, doo-wop, jazz, it's full of repetition, but it's not simply repetition. 
If you think about the hallelujah chorus, it's not hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. That would be boring, right? <laughs> it's always a repetition and a development. That's parallelism. The two lines in the, of parallel don't simply repeat each other. They say something slightly different the second time through. And what, what's happening then is a development of an idea that happens over the course of a poem. If you listen to um, Beethoven, he was the master of taking the tiniest piece, taking the tiniest motif, and through parallelism, making it deliciously interesting. Check out this uh, couple of lines from Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. I think it's going to happen. No, it's not happening. There it is. Here's the same motif turned over and over and over and over again. In different orchestration. But over and over the same four notes. Bum, 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 bum. How boring could it possibly be? Bum, 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 bum. But if you change it over and over again, before you know it, you have a very compelling piece of music. Parallelism is a present presentation of a motif and a development of a motif over time. Now, I'm going through all of this not simply to make you um, identify parallel structures in music, but what I want us to do is listen to the prayers of the psalmist with both ears. You could just go through your life listening to Beethoven's Fifth and thinking, boy, that's really nice. You might whistle it on your way home. Or you could ask yourself, why does that sound so good? What is Beethoven doing? And, and that simple act of listening more carefully and asking yourself, how is he making sense? How is the structure of this piece engaging me? You could listen to every piece of music in the world like this. You could ask yourself, well, how, does, how is that hymn making sense? Or you could look at this, this beautiful architecture and you could say, how does parallelism work in this building? Could have been that side of the wall, that side of the church could have been totally different. <laughs> but because it has symmetry to it, because it has a structure, we appreciate it more. We say, yes, this is a gorgeous place. It's be gorgeous because it's in parallel. So when we listen to the Psalms, we don't just listen to try to get what the psalmist is saying. We listen to how the psalmist is making his argument to God, because the psalmist is trying to use every possible way to make their prayer most convincing to God. Now, I'm not saying that you have to pray in the most highfalutin ways, but it's instructive to think and to see that prayers in the Old Testament are carefully constructed artistic units. Many of us pray with a sort of, well, God, you know, I uh, really need you. I love you. It's kind of thought, not thoughtless prayers, but not very careful prayers. The Psalms encourage us to pray carefully, to pray with deep um, intentionality, because you're not just talking to anybody. You're talking to God. And you're not just talking to God about random stuff. You're talking to God about the most important things in your life, typically. You're asking God, please, please help Aunt Betty. Please, please help my kids. They're struggling. You're not just talking to God about nothing. You're talking to God about the most important stuff. And it makes sense 
to pray carefully. So the Psalms and the Psalms are beautiful in that they've given you ways of praying already. You don't have to be brilliant necessarily. All you have to do is read the Psalms. The Psalms are brilliant for you. And you can find your own voice in the prayers of the psalmist. Just like we heard uh, this morning, we can find our own voice in the psalmist's cry in Psalm 40. There is a psalm, I believe, for every situation that we have and, the, or, and that we could have. The psalms provide a, a script, a, a prayer book for all of us to enjoy. So listen to songs. Uh, listen to songs carefully. Listen to these, these psalms with both ears. And as you pray, pray carefully. It's not to discourage you to pray, but it's to encourage you to pray even with more care and thoughtfulness.